Today's our, today is our second half of immune defenses, and we're going to talk about adaptive defenses today. And uh, of course, there's a whole immunology course here taught by Dr. Moshowitz dedicated to discussing this. So obviously, we can't go over all of it, but I want to focus on things that are relevant to virus infection to give you an overview, mainly the antagonism, as you saw from last time. So this was our introductory slide from the last lecture. We're talking about uh, three different kinds of defenses. Intrinsic, which you talked about last time, uh, innate defenses, and you should understand the differences between these. And today we're going to talk about the adaptive immune system. And the key here is that the adaptive system is tailored to the pathogen. It matches the precise virus, as you will see. And there is memory associated with it. You don't have memory for the innate and intrinsic defenses. They can just be induced and they act rather broadly. Now last time we finished with this image of an infected mucosal layer. So you remember mucosal layers are the most common portals of virus entry, respiratory tract, alimentary tract, etc. We have some viruses infecting epithelial cells. Uh, these cells are producing cytokines because the viruses have been sensed by the cells. The cytokines attract dendritic cells and macrophages, and then these cells will die, the infected cells will die, releasing bits of viral DNA or RNA and protein. The dendritic cells, macrophages will pick that up because they are they phagocytose material. They will sense it as well and then travel to the lymph node. And all this is mediated by chemokines that tell the dendritic cells where to go. And in the lymph node, the dendritic cells will instruct both T and B cells to make their uh, antibodies and uh, to become effector T cells. So the product is antibodies, as we will see, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, also T helper uh, lymphocytes. So these mature in the lymph node and come out into the circulation and eventually will uh, make their way to the infected areas. So we're going to talk about that today, what goes on uh, in the lymph node. So here is an image showing how the dendritic cell is instructing adaptive immunity. So our dendritic cell has just returned from patrolling a mucosal layer where it has picked up some viral uh, material. And here you can see uh, there's an endosome containing a virus particle. It could be virus proteins. It could be apoptotic bodies. It doesn't matter. Uh, and this has been sensed and it's turned on uh, a number of cytokine genes. What's also happened in this cell, and we'll see this in more detail in a moment, the viral proteins have been processed and displayed on the surface of cell surface proteins called major histocompatibility complex proteins, or MHC. And there are two kinds of those. There's type 1 uh, and type 2. And the type 1 instruct uh, the CD8 cells, and the type 2 instruct the CD4 cells. And a medical student gave me a nice way to remind this, remember this a long time ago. The product of multiplication, if you remember eight, then uh, MHC1 always binds to CD8s because one times eight is eight. And MHC2 binds to CD4s because two times four is eight. Okay, it's a great way. And I remember it that way to this day because I always get confused. So MHC1 and two, MHC1, CD8s, MH2, CD4s. And what they are doing is displaying short viral peptides, 10 to 20 amino acids long, and asking the T cells, are these foreign? Now we have in us T cells with receptors on their surfaces. So this peptide is being presented to the T cell receptor. And we have in us the T cells that will recognize huge numbers of foreign epitopes, probably every possible combination that you could encounter. All the self-reactive T cells have been uh, destroyed at, as we develop. And somewhere in you, there's one or two T cells that recognize an epitope, say, from influenza virus. And eventually, that T cell will find the uh, MHC presenting it. And once it's recognized, and this interaction has to occur together with some other protein, protein interactions you can see here, uh, some cell surface dendritic cell proteins interacting with other T cell proteins. 
on the cell surface. This causes the CD8 T cell to start dividing. It activates it, becomes a cytotoxic T cell, which contains cytotoxic granules, and this is going to be a killer. We'll talk about that a bit later. And this proliferates, makes tons and tons of cells, some from one or two specific for that one peptide. This is amazing. In your whole body, you have one or two specific for each peptide. Uh, you get thousands and thousands of them, and of course, they can go on and take care of the infection. And MHC2 instructs CD4 T cells. Again, these uh, similar fashion, the T cell receptor recognizes a particular peptide. Uh, that leads to proliferation, and then you have effector cells. And in this case, these make cytokines, which have other roles, as we will see. Together with these viral peptides, the dendritic cell is making cytokines. You can see that illustrated here, these little green dots. And they're binding to cytokine receptors on the CD8 or the CD4 T cells. This is really important because this is going to determine whether we make antibodies or cytotoxic T cells, as you'll see later on, because every virus infection needs a particular balance uh, of both of them. All right, so this is what the dendritic cell does. They also present uh, antigens to B cells. It's a little bit of a different process, less well understood. They tend not to be processed, so I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, this is really a topic for many lectures of an immunology course. All right, so this is happening in the lymph node, and once these cells are activated and start to proliferate, they leave the lymph, they get into the circulation and find the infected areas, and they get there by sensing chemokines that are produced by the infected cells. They circulate all around you. You know, a single cell can get around your whole system in minutes, so it doesn't take a lot of time for this to happen. One last point I want to make about this it's very different from the NK cell recognition that we talked about yesterday. Remember, NK cells are part of the innate system. NK cells will recognize infected cells, but not by virtue of viral peptides displayed on MHC. NK cells are antigen independent in their recognition. They recognize altered cells. Remember, they recognize downregulation of class I molecules. Uh, they recognize upregulation of uh, activating molecules. They, they recognize that the cell is infected, but not by virtue of viral peptides. So really important distinction between uh, DC T cell talking and NK cell infected cell talking. Let's talk a little bit about how these peptides are put up into the MHC molecules. Uh, here we're looking at class II molecules. And class two is presented to what number of cell? Four or eight? You're looking at the board, so you should be able to answer it. It's four, because two times four is eight. And so we're looking at uh, CD4 cells. So this is, um, M MHC class two is typically found on antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells and macrophages. They take up proteins from the extracellular space. So remember our epithelial cell that's infected, it's releasing viral proteins. The DCs are taking them up. These are endocytosis. They're chopped up into peptide-sized fragments, and they're loaded onto the MHC class II molecule. That molecule, of course, is, is produced by the secretory pathway. It's made in the ER. It goes through the Golgi, uh, gets into this vesicle with the peptides, and the peptides are loaded, one per MHC uh, molecule. And eventually, this makes its way to the surface. So this is all going on in, say, a dendritic cell. And then the DC is in the lymph node and presents this to a CD4 cell. And if there's a match with the receptor on the CD4 cell, that's the T cell receptor, TCR, uh, then the, the CD4 cell will proliferate. And if there's no match, that, that's the end of the line. So this is um, class two presentation. It's also called the uh, exogenous pathway because the proteins are taken up from outside the cell, and that's in contrast to the class I pathway, which we'll look at next, which is an endogenous pathway which presents peptides from virus-infected cells. Now, do you think that viruses can interfere with this pathway? You couldn't get a wrong answer. You know, it's absolutely, they interfere with everything. So class two, we don't know as much about. Class one, you'll see, is amazing. They interfere with every step. But we know, for example, that uh, viruses interfere with uh, transcription of the gene encoding MHC2. Human cytomegalovirus makes a protein that interferes with transcription. So when it gets into a cell, it turns off class two uh, expression. 
uh, and therefore these cells, uh, the peptides can't be presented. Very, very clever. All right, so that is class two to CD4. And here is class one presentation to CD8, of course, because one uh, times um, eight is eight. And here is the endogenous pathway. These are virus infected cells. And most cells in our body have class one MHC on their surface. And that's because most of our cells can be infected, including dendritic cells and macrophages. So they can also use this pathway as well to present an antigen to CD8 cells. But typically this would be a cell somewhere in your body that's infected and it is going to um, be recognized by a cytotoxic T lymphocyte. But here we're instructing the CD8 cell. So this is a virus infected cell and here there are viral proteins in the cytoplasm. That's a common feature of uh, all virus infected cell. And what the cell does is um, as part of this pathway, it puts the protein through the proteasome, a big proteolytic degradation machine that resides in the cytoplasm, and you get peptides, very much like the peptides made previously for class two presentation. These peptides are pumped into the lumen of the ER by a transporter. It's actually a pump whose function it is uh, to pump peptides into the ER so they can be loaded onto the class one molecules that are going to be assembled there. And the TAP is the name for some of these proteins, which are part of the transporter. This stands for transporter for antigen presentation. So the uh, class one molecules are also made just like class two. They're put in the, Golgi, uh, the ER uh, and then they're loaded with peptide and then they're shipped to the cell surface through the Golgi uh, by the transport vesicles and then they get on the surface each with one peptide and then they present that peptide to the T cell receptor. And again, if there's a match with the particular T cell, that T cell is activated. So lots of T cells will combine and sample these presented antigens until the one is found that it reacts with. Um, so this can be done again by any infected cell in your body or by antigen presenting cells like DCs or macrophages. Can this be interfered with uh, in, by viruses? You don't know? Yeah, of course. Tons. Here are three ways that they're interfered with, well more. Uh, the TAP transporter is a big target. And here are three different viruses that make different proteins that interfere with the transporter. So these green things here are enlargements of the TAP transporter or the peptide transporter. Herpes simplex virus, human cytomegalovirus, and Epstein-Barr virus. These are all herpes viruses. And these are all viruses that you will see tend to cause persistent infections. They stay with you forever. All of you have at least one of these viruses infecting you. Their genome is in you. Periodically, they make viruses and you shed them. We'll talk about that later. Uh, they each make a viral protein. Here it is uh, for herpes, ICP-47, uh, for cytomegalovirus, it's US-6, and for Epstein-Barr, it's BNLF-2A. And they interfere with transporting of peptides through this channel. In fact, ICP-47 actually binds the peptides so they can't get through. Uh, and, and US-6 and BNLF bind ATP, which is needed for transport. You can see this the channel's being closed up here. It doesn't let the peptides through, and this one also binds peptides. So they work by blocking peptide loading so the cell cannot be detected. So T cells can't be activated, and an infected cell cannot be detected as well. We have some other intercessions here as well. There's a cytomegalovirus protein that inhibits the proteasome. It actually binds to it, inhibits its activity, so the peptides can't be made. Uh, there are proteins. Here's another cytomegalovirus one, US6, uh, against the same one that messes with the transporter. Uh, this messes with, pre with um, the insertion of uh, MHC class 1 in the ER. There are other viral proteins. Here another cytomegalovirus, US3, that uh, inhibits transport of the um, type 1 protein. So cytomegalovirus has a lot of antagonists, as you can see, and this is one of the viruses that stays with us uh, for, for our whole lifetime once we get it. And it, that's one of the reasons it does that. It's not detected. It stays under the radar of the immune system. So this is a summary of all these interference with class one. So this is a major target. Viruses have evolved to interfere at just about every step of the class one presentation pathway from class one synthesis, that is transcription and transport. Uh, uh, well, that's separate from transport, just transcription and, and synthesis. The transporter associated with antigen processing, TAP, we told you how some of these viral proteins 
uh, interfere with its function. There are also viral proteins that interfere with its synthesis, so it never even gets there in the first place. And then a whole bunch of proteins that interfere with class one transport. Look at the different ways. Retaining class one in the ER so it doesn't get to the cell surface. Uh, retaining it in the pre-Golgi. Pushing it into the cytoplasm so it can't get on the cell membrane. Pushing it to lysosomes where of course it would be degraded. Uh, binding to the surface so it can't present down-regulating by endocytosis. It's just, just amazing, and all these viruses typically cause persistent infections. Okay, so that is class one and two, and we have a question here, which is already up, I guess. Correct, and the question is, the antigen presentation by dendritic cells in the lymph node has which features? Number five, that's right, it's all of the above. Each of these is correct. Presentation of peptides on MHC1 to CD8s, of course, MHC2 to CD4s. Viruses counter MHC2 at the transcriptional level. That was on one slide. And they counter MHC1 at many levels. So it's all of the above. So you should be familiar in, with these general approaches to interfering with uh, antigen presentation. Okay, so now we are, we've sort of got a, a feeling for how the antigens are presented to T cells, I haven't told you about B cells, but you'll have to just assume that happens and we don't need the details. Let's talk about the effectors that result from that antigen presentation. These are the effectors of the adaptive response. And uh, on the right are the two types of T cells that are made. And on the left are the B cells that make antibodies. So let's take the T cells on the right first. So we've got our antigens in the lymph node that's been presented to T cells. and um, again, on the left is the CD4 pathway. So th we're actually starting from the bone marrow and the thymus, but here is the lymph node here. This TH cell or T helper cell or CD4 uh, positive lymphocyte has uh, encountered a dendritic cell that presents an antigen, a viral peptide that it matches with. It responds by proliferating and making a lot of these uh, T helper cells, and they can go one of two ways. They can become Th1 or Th2 cells, Th1 up here, Th2, and that's depending on what kind of cytokines they produce. So the helper cells are really good at making different sorts of cytokines. And the Th1 cells, again, characterized by a set of Th1 cytokines, those cytokines are important for the differentiation of uh, the CTL precursors in the thymus into CTLs. All right, so if a particular virus infection requires CTLs, we'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, you preferentially induce Th1 uh, helper cells and you get a lot of CTLs made. Uh, the, C the Th2 cytokines are needed for differentiation of B cells into plasma cells so you can make a lot of antibodies. So for viruses that require an antibody response, uh, you preferentially make Th2 T helper cells that have a lot of antibody made. Most virus infections result in a mix of Th1 and Th2, and um, some need more Th1, some need more Th2, it depends on the virus. And then on the other part of this uh, T cell uh, scheme here, we have the generation of cytotoxic T lymphocytes. This is the CD8 lineage. These are, again, recognizing, um, they're, they're recognizing a dendritic cell presenting a peptide. They differentiate into cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which then go on to kill infected self cells. So they will go out of the lymph node into the blood, find your infected cells, and kill them. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment. So those are the two kind of T cells that we make. And then on the left, of course, are the antibodies. Again, the uh, B cells with antibody on their surface, these are present in the lymph node. They sense the presence of protein. They, they don't uh, actually sense processed protein. They sense full-length protein, so it's a different pathway. When, in, when there's a match between an antibody sitting on the surface of this B cell and a particular foreign antigen, uh, these are stimulated to form plasma cells. These no longer have antibody on their surface, but they make a ton of antibody molecules. 2,000 antibody molecules per second in your lymph node. Okay? It's a lot of antibodies, just one B cell. And then they proliferate and make tons and tons of these. So they make antibodies, and we'll talk about how they work to uh, interfere with virus infection. All right, antibodies, uh, schematic on the upper right. These are large proteins, which I'm sure you have all heard about at one time or another. They're made up of two heavy chains and two light chains, and they have 
uh, areas that are needed for interacting with cells and areas that interact with viruses, the so-called variable regions at the top. These are essential for many virus infections. Typically, they're needed for defending. You get a vaccine, you make antibodies. That's why the vaccine protects you from infection. And as you'll see, they neutralize viruses. And the blood is a big place where antibodies work. These are released into the circulation. They neutralize virus particles and thereby inhibit infection. Uh, we also make a certain kind of antibody at our mucosal surfaces. It's actually secreted and placed on the mucosal surface right in the mucus. It's called IgA. And this blocks entry of many viruses that comes in, that come in by those routes. For the most part, uh, antibodies are important for protection. There's always some exceptions, of course. For some viruses, you need them for recovery. For most virus infections, they come up too late in infection to really in, uh, affect recovery. Recovery is instead mediated by cellular responses, the T cells that we just talked about. But again, there are always exceptions. There are a few viruses where antibodies are needed for recovery. Now, many antibodies are neutralizing. They're not all neutralizing. So if you put a virus into an animal, the animal makes antibodies. It makes a whole host of antibodies to the exposed proteins on the surface of a virus. And many of them are neutralizing, but not all of them. So what is a neutralizing antibody? What that means is it blocks infection. So here's a plaque assay. We've put 11 plaques on these plates. And on the top, we have, before putting the virus on the plate, we have mixed the virus with dilutions of serum from an animal that had been immunized with this particular virus. So we're looking to see if there are neutralizing antibodies in the serum. And you can see at a 1 to 10,000 dilution of serum, there's no difference uh, in the neutralization compared with serum from an animal that did not get the injection, did not get the antigen. In 1 to 1,000, now you see an inhibition of plaque formation. And at 1 to 100, all the plaques are gone, 1 to 10. So this animal is making antibodies that block infection. This is the definition of neutralizing antibodies. They block virus infection. And a plaque assay is one way you can measure them. There are other ways you can do it as well. All right, so that's what I mean by neutralizing antibodies. It's really important to realize, recognize that not all antibodies made in response to an infection are neutralizing. Many of them bind the wrong epitopes and do not interfere with infection. Now, when you immunize an animal with a virus, you get a very specific antibody response. So here's an experiment where uh, mice were immunized with poliovirus. And then at different days after immunization, they've taken some serum from the mice and did a plaque assay, like I showed you, to look for neutralizing uh, antibodies. And here, they have gone one step further. They looked at the different kinds of antibodies that are made, because we, only, we don't just make one kind. We make IgG, IgM, and IgA. The very first antibodies to produ be produced are IgM. These are antibodies. They're five antibody molecules joined together uh, by their FC portions. And so this is thought to occur early on during antibody maturation where the affinity for the, of the antibody for the virus isn't so great, so this makes up for it. Antibodies undergo many rounds of affinity maturation so that eventually they bind really tightly to the antigen. That happens in the lymph node. And that takes time, and until that happens, the IgMs can sit in and, and, and neutralize. So IgMs are made first and then they decline. And then after that, IgM are made, which are the predominant antibodies made that are high affinity. And also IgA uh, are present in the serum as well, and they come up later. So if you have a person who is sick, and, you, and that person comes into the clinic, and you take serum, and you find they have IgM antibodies to influenza, that means they have a pretty recent infection. But if they have IgG, that could have happened any time over a few weeks ago. So the nature of the antibody is often used to tell when a person has had the infection. Here's another experiment showing you that if you give neutralizing antibodies to an animal, you can protect them from virus infection. So this is passive antibody. It means we're injecting antibody uh, into the animal. So these are, again, I think these are uh, 
mice injected with poliovirus, we're looking at percent paralyzed here and the titer of antibody in them. So uh, the higher number is a higher titer. So you can see the animals that didn't receive an injection, they're all paralyzed. And then as you add increasing amounts of uh, antibody, fewer and fewer are paralyzed. So the way the experiment works is you would put the antibody in, then you put the virus in. So if there's a lot of antibody, it neutralizes the virus and you can't get infection. So this shows you that antibodies can protect you, and this is why, in part, vaccines work. Yes? If polio only paralyzes as a mistake, why are so many of the control animals paralyzed? So polio only paralyzes human. The question is, if polio only paralyzes by mistake, why are so many animals paralyzed? So that observation is true only in people. Right? Polio only paralyzes one in 100 people, but in mice, if you put enough virus uh, intraperitoneally or intravenously, you can get them all paralyzed. So we're obviously bypassing something that uh, is present in humans, by the way. A secretory antibodies are really important for protecting against mucosal infections. This is IgA. This is produced, again, also by plasma cells that are in the circulation. But at mucosal surfaces, which is shown here, one big mucosal cell, uh, the plasma cell releases uh, precursors to IgA, which are shown here. They're linked. They're actually dimers linked together. Uh, they are attached to a protein, uh, the Ig receptor, shown here in brown, and that leads to their endocytosis at the bottom of the basal layer of the uh, epithelial cell, the mucosal epithelial cell. They're brought to the top by transcytosis and released uh, at the top of the cell. So these end up in your mucus, and, and uh, they can protect you uh, the, the secretory piece is cleaved off. That's how they're released from the cell. They can protect you from viruses that come in at mucosal surfaces like uh, influenza and respiratory surfaces or rotaviruses in your gastrointestinal tract. All right, so these are very important for protecting there because if you wait for the virus to get into your blood, it, you might already have disease. So there are many outcomes of making antibodies against viruses which are schematized in this slide. So on the top, uh, this is actually using uh, HIV as an example, but it applies to all viruses. We have a neutralizing antibody that binds to the virus. It can be enveloped or icosahedral, it doesn't matter. This will neutralize infectivity, as I've told you. It protects the cell against infection. These antibodies can also coat the virus and allow them to be lysed by complement. That's the protein system we talked about yesterday. It allows them to be phagocytosed by cells that have receptors for the antibody. So at the end of the antibody, opposite from the part that binds the antigen, this is called the FC portion, and there are receptors on many cells that will bind this and take it up. So if antibodies coat a virus, they can be taken up and destroyed. Now, if our antibodies don't happen to protect infection, uh, we get infected cells, but even there, antibodies can be protective as well. And these are some of the mechanisms here. Uh, neutralizing antibodies can um, cause the cells to be lysed by immune cells. You can even have non-neutralizing antibodies directed against different epitopes, which have inhibitory consequences. For example, um, there can be signaling through these complexes that turn on pathways that inhibit virus replication. You can even inhibit virus release by having antibodies on the surface. So if you imagine this is an infected cell putting up viral glycoproteins on the surface, the binding of the antibodies can prevent uh, virus release or even cell-to-cell -cell transmission. So I don't want you to think that neutralizing viruses floating around is the only way that antibodies can work. There are actually lots of ways that they can uh, prevent infection. And here's another summary of what antibodies can do. You may remember from a while ago that cells, many viruses bind uh, cells and are taken up by the endocytic pathway. And then low pH leads to RNA release. Well, antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, can interfere with some of these steps. So here on the right, you can see uh, this virus particle is coated with antibodies, and they are blocking attachment of the virus to the receptor. They're blocking the attachment sites. But not all antibodies block attachment. Some of them actually cause the particles to aggregate, uh, so they don't ever start an infection, they're just all clumped together. Uh, some antibodies allow attachment in endocytosis, but they block uncoating. All right, so the virus will get into the endosome, but the, when the pH drops, the presence of the antibodies 
restricts the fusion proteins or some other movements of the viral proteins that are needed for uncoding. So neutralizing antibodies can block at many different stages uh, of infection. Do uh, viruses get around neutralizing antibodies, you think? Yeah, of course. Every time I ask that, the answer is yes. And here are just some ways that viruses do that. This is, again, uh, HIV. Here's a virion. HIV is brilliant at evading antibody responses. It's one of the reasons we haven't been able to make a vaccine yet against this virus. Here's a virion with many, many ways of evading neutralizing antibodies. Um, so here, the virus, of course, has an envelope on its surface. It's a trimer. And some antibodies will actually bind and block uh, infection. Uh, but um, here, it also puts up some spikes that are inactive, and they don't have any function for the virus. So the binding of antibody has no effect. It serves just to pull the antibodies out. It also puts some uh, transmembrane fragments on the surface without the head that binds the receptor, and the antibodies will bind that and get distracted as well. And viruses also shed the, vi the receptor binding portion called SU or surface, and these will bind antibodies, and that has, of course, no effect on infection. The actual surface glycoprotein, which is shown here, the SU part, which is the sphere, has lots of ways of avoiding being recognized. It has a lot of sugar on it, which makes it poorly immunogenic, so B cells don't recognize it. It has an immunodominant loop here. So what that means is you get a lot of antibodies made against it, and they bind it, but they have no effect on infectivity. The actual uh, important part of the molecule is over here which is obstructed in many ways. It's recessed, uh, the receptor binding site is recessed, and the formation of oligomers, you can see it's a trimer, makes it very difficult for antibodies to get in there. So this can happen both on the intact virion and also on the infected cell. Every one of these mechanisms is also active. So the virus has amazing ways to get around neutralizing antibodies. As we'll see later in the HIV lecture, we make plenty of antibodies against HIV, but the virus simply evades them. How about other viruses? All right, on the left is rhinovirus. This virus exists in over 150 different antigenic types. So it's pretty certain that if you got one rhinovirus infection a year, you would go through all the serotypes before you, your life ended and still not have immunity to all of them. So that's its strategy for avoiding immune responses. These serotypes circulate globally, and that's why you get a couple of colds every year, because you just haven't had the experience with all of them. And so it makes it difficult to make an, a, a vaccine. We don't know how to make a vaccine against 150 different uh, virus types. So that's one strategy. The other is shown on the right by the influenza hemagglutinin. And remember, this is the viral glycoprotein on the surface of the particle that binds the receptor. And this is highly variable. It changes from year to year. And these colored portions, so at the top is the receptor binding site. And this is the part that would be in the viral membrane. This is, again, a trimer. The colored portion are regions that change. So when you are infected with influenza, you make antibodies against it. But the virus makes so many different HA molecules, because it's highly mutagenic, that there are always going to be some that don't bind the antibody. You just need one amino acid change in a particular epitope that's recognized by an antibody to lower antibody binding. And each of these colored areas are epitopes that are recognized by antibodies. So the virus simply changes from year to year. And that's why we have to change the vaccine every year, every few years. These epitopes at the top are near the receptor binding site. Uh, these are highly variable regions. And these epitopes on the stem are far away from the receptor binding site. They uh, interfere with uh, uncoding, with the fusion steps in the endosome. Now, it turns out that some of these residues in the stem are highly conserved. They never change. So people are trying to use this to make a vaccine, which you would get once for, for your entire life uh, against this virus. So two different strategies for evading uh, the antibody response. And the next question is, which statement about antiviral antibodies is incorrect? Great. <laughs> That's great, number two. Yes, they don't always neutralize virus infectivity, right? I want you to understand that not all antibodies that we make are neutralizing. Everything else is correct. They are important for protection. They may block attachment. They, may, they can be found at mucosal surfaces, and then IgM is the first to appear. Good. 
All right, so that's antibodies. Let's move to cellular mechanisms of protection, cell-mediated immunity. This is really important for clearing most virus infections. So you get infected, you start to make an antibody response, but that's not going to help you clear it for most infections. That will help you later with its memory of an, with another infection, but cellular responses are important for recovery. And these are the lymphocytes that are instructed in the thymus. And in particular, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, the CD8 cells, differentiate to form cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which are full of granules that uh, will kill the infected cell. And so what happens is these recognize an infected cell, again, by viral peptides displayed in MHC class. If this is a CD8, what class is it? It's one. It's MHC1. So this is a virus-infected cell, uh, it, and the cell has a mechanism for putting peptides up on the surface in MHC1. The CTL comes uh, over, and that CTL, of course, has been instructed in the thymus by the original dendritic cell, so there are lots of these now patrolling. It recognizes the viral peptide as foreign. It also sees that the cell is self, because it recognizes MHC1 here by virtue of uh, another receptor, uh, and then it kills this infected cell. It can kill it by releasing uh, the particles in the cytoplasm, uh, which contain uh, membrane-lytic uh, enzymes. So these get very close. This doesn't really show you how close they get. They actually touch. They make a synapse. The CTL releases granules that poke holes in the infected cell. And the CTL can also release ligands that turn on apoptosis in the infected cell. They turn on programmed cell death. Okay? So this is how we recover from infection. Of course, this causes cell damage. So when you get influenza, you feel lousy for weeks because a lot of your respiratory epithelium has been trashed by the CTL response. But that's how we have evolved to get rid of uh, influenza. And of course, there are countermeasures to this as well. Many viruses can escape this. One of the common ways is simply by generating peptides that are no longer recognized by all those T cells. Okay, just you change one amino acid in the peptide, and now the T cells don't recognize you as infected, and you can stay around. There are many other ways of evading uh, cell-mediated immunity as well. So here are the kinetics of production of cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So again, these are animals that have been infected with the virus. At the top is the virus titer. We're looking here at virus in the spleen. This happens to be a virus that replicates in the spleen. You can see there's a very, there's a very rapid peak in about, I don't know, two or three or five days there, and then the virus goes down. And then in the bottom panel, we're looking at uh, cytotoxic T cells. So the green bars are cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So this is a very specific assay that measures their ability to lyse target cells. So you can see uh, they go up after virus titer has peaked, but still pretty soon after infection. Then they go down very quickly as the infection is resolved. So these are very important for clearing infection. If you remember the antibody profile, the antibodies go up much more slowly. So in many infections, they can't have a role in protection. So you see this virus infection is over by day nine, which is correlating with the increase of these uh, CTLs. Now the blue line is CD8 lymphocytes that are specific for this particular epitope that is recognized by the CTL. These are memory cells. You can see they last a long time. So you don't have a, a whole lot of them in you, but you have some, and then if you get infected again, these can respond uh, very quickly. Here's an experiment to show you the relative importance of antibody versus cellular immunity. This is a um, infection of, of animals with monkeypox virus, a pox virus. And so we infect the animals at day zero, and then we do something to their immune system. Here's the control, we don't do anything. By day 22, they have very high titers of neutralizing antibody in the serum. So these are uh, really, really good titers. Uh, you infect them with monkeypox on day 28, and then you're looking for death. So none of these animals die at zero out of four. They're, they're protected because they've been immunized with uh, virus on day zero. Now, these animals you immunize and then you deplete their B cells. So you start depleting before immunization and then afterwards. So you can take all the B cells out of them or most of them. Uh, then they have very low antibody titers as you would predict because B cells are needed to make antibodies. You infect them and three out of four die. Uh, 
And then you can do the same experiment. Instead, you deplete CD8 cells. And this has no effect on antibody or very little effect on antibody production. The CD8 shouldn't have much of an effect there. This is probably just uh, experimental variation. And then you infect and you see uh, none of them die. So these animals still have antibody. They're protected. The CD8s don't protect them against infection. They will help them to recover from the infection. So you can see, I think, that for some viruses, uh, antibody is important for, for protecting cellular mediated immunity is important for recovering and that varies according to virus for some viruses cell mediated immunity cd8s are important for protection so how is the balance decided how do we know to make the right combination of antibody versus cellular responses well it all starts here at the infected cell site where dendritic cells are picking up cytokines and peptides and proteins from the dead cells. They go to the lymph node, and they are the ones that tell the T cells in the lymph node whether to be Th1 or Th2, which biases you to either cytotoxic T cells or antibody production. Let's take a look at that here. Now, we've talked about this quite a bit now. The, the, the T cells in the lymph node makes contact with the dendritic cells and macrophages that are displaying antigen. They exchange the peptide in the class one or class two molecule. Uh, of course, for, for TH cells, this would be class two. Uh, and they also exchange cytokines. If you remember the very first slide where I was showing you how DCs instruct T cells, lots of cytokines were being exchanged. So the nature of the peptide and the nature of the cytokines, which depends on the virus that's infecting and where it is, will determine whether you get Th1 or Th2 helper cells produced. So again, Th1 helper cells make cytokines that largely bias to CTL production. And Th2 helper cells will bias you to antibody production. Okay, so the information exchange between the sentinels and the lymph node T cells determines whether you're mostly gonna have antibody or CTLs, or a mix of the two. Most infections are a mix of the two. And of course, yes, there are countermeasures uh, to this as well. So for example, if a cytotoxic response, a Th1 response is important for clearance of a particular virus, many viruses will make proteins that antagonize those cytokines so you don't have a lot of CTLs made. Okay, so you can, the virus can actually bias the immune response to one that is not good for eliminating it. This is also important for vaccines. We have to make sure vaccines induce the right Th1, Th2 mix compared to a natural infection. Otherwise, we're not going to get protection. All right, the next question is, for some infections, CTLs are more important for protection than antibody. How is the CTL antibody balance determined? Number four. All right. Okay, it's not toll-like receptors. It's not intrinsic defenses, which are even before toll-like receptors not autophagy, it's by the mix of peptides and cytokines presented by the DCs to the T cells and the lymphocytes. And it has nothing to do whether the capsid is icosahedral or, or helical. Now, an, an important feature, we've talked about how the adaptive response is tailored to the virus, the antibodies and the CTLs are tailored to those peptides or the viral proteins that are made. We also get memory. This is the other feature of adapted responses. So you have a memory of an infection. That way, when you are infected at a, at a second time, you will be immune. You will not get, you might not get disease. You might be infected. The virus might replicate a bit, but it will be neutralized and you will not get uh, disease. And that's called memory. But of course, I've told you how some viruses get around that, even get around memory. So even though this is a powerful feature, it can be evaded. And this is the basis for vaccination, of course. You get immunized once, and then you have a memory to that experience which will protect you for hopefully the rest of your life. So here is immunological memory diagrammed. We're looking at uh, an infection with a virus here, and then we're measuring either antibody or T cells, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, doesn't really matter. So after the first infection, within seven to 14 days, you typically get uh, an immune response. Uh, then the infection is resolved, immunity goes down to a basal level. And then you are, what, you are protected. You have protective immunity for whatever time until you encounter that virus again. Uh, and then when you are infected, say, another time, you have a much more rapid and more robust uh, 
uh, immune response. And that's because of memory. And so you can make a mild or inapparent infection uh, out of that encounter because the antibodies or T cells will prevent the development of disease. And ideally, memory should last for years. Unfortunately, not all our vaccines are good enough to make uh, lifelong memory. So we still have a lot of work to do. Now, why do we have immunological memory? I'm just going to briefly tell you the, the different reasons. This, again, is, this can be the subject of an entire lecture. We have what are called memory B cells in us uh, that live for a long time. And these are B cells that have on their surface antibodies against a specific virus. So these have already gone through the selection and maturation process. So you know, this is an influenza virus specific antibody of some sort. And these can live a long time in our spleen and lymph nodes. And then when you encounter an antigen again, when you are infected, uh, these B cells will, will be stimulated to produce antibodies very quickly because they don't have to go through the all the class switching and uh, somatic mutation and selection affinity selection mechanisms that would have to occur in the lymph node. That's one mechanism. We also think there are plasma cells that are long lived. Again, these are cells that produce antibodies at high levels. They don't have antibodies on their surface. They're made just to make a ton of, uh, of uh, antibodies. We think that these are probably in the bone marrow and they live a long time, and they probably are producing low levels of antibodies to keep a low level of protection. And again, uh, when, you, um, are, when you activate the B cells with the antibody on the surface, then you get many more of these produced. But there's obviously no way for these to respond to antigen because there's no receptor on their surface. And finally, there are also memory T cells. I showed you in that one experiment that you get uh, immune memory of T cells. And again, the, the mechanisms are, are similar. You have uh, T cells that have already gone through the selection process that live in us for long periods of time. There are not a lot of them, but they're already there ready to respond. And here, for many years, it was thought, how do you maintain memory? Do you need to have an infection? Or can you maintain memory in the absence of infection? You always need to have a stimulation of these B cells with the antibody on the surface to make a new pool. Well, here's an experiment done in the in the 1800s, which showed you don't need to have infection to have memory. This was an experiment done by an epidemiologist. He studied some outbreaks of measles on these remote islands to the north of the UK called the Faroe Islands. There was an outbreak of measles in 1781. Now, there wasn't any travel to, this, to these islands back then. It was only when a boat came uh, that people arrived from elsewhere. So measles was introduced when, when boats came to this island. This island was free of measles for the next 65 years after this outbreak. Uh, there was another outbreak in 1846, so by then there had been a new, enough new susceptibles uh, born, um, and they didn't encounter measles because it wasn't brought into the country. None of the individuals who survived the original epidemic were infected. So this is a long time, 1781 to 1846. That's immune memory, and there was no measles virus uh, on the island because there were no other outbreaks. So it's an interesting experiment that shows you don't have to have uh, re-exposure to antigen. Antibodies, in, in after immunization, antibodies to various viruses can last a long time. You can detect them in serum. They're not high levels, they're at low levels. But you can detect them for years. And so these are some examples where uh, people have been examined for antibodies against various viruses here on the left. And on the top, these systemic infections, they're looking for antibodies in the blood. And you can see, look how long you can detect antibodies uh, after infection. Yellow fever, 75 years. Measles, 65 years. Uh, polio, 40 years. Vaccinia, 75 years. That's the virus that you use to immunize against smallpox. So these antibodies last a long time. So probably the antibody molecules themselves are not long lasting, but they're just being produced at low levels by those long lived uh, plasma cells and are being resupplied by the B cells with the antigen on the surface. So again, this can be maintained for a long time, probably lifelong for many viruses without antigen being present. And as far as it, this study was done in people who only had one experience with infection and no other. Now look at the bottom here. This is really important. These are antibodies in, at mucosal surfaces against viruses that infect those areas, coronas, influenza, respiratory syncytia, rotavirus, the gut, mucosa. Look how short the duration of antibody is. 
So mucosal antibodies are very short-lived, and this is why it's really hard to immunize against mucosal pathogens like influenza uh, and rotaviruses and so forth. For reasons that are not quite clear, uh, there's not a lot of long-term persistent antigen, probably because there are no long-term memory cells. We think there are no uh, plasma cells beneath the mucosa to produce these antibodies for years. All right, the next question is, what is characteristic of immune memory? All right, number five. Of course, it's all of the above. It's memory B cells, it's long-lived plasma cells, it lasts without exposure to virus, and it's antibodies that can last a long time as well, probably because they're being resupplied. So it's all of the above. All right, now for the rest of the time, I want to tell you, I've told you why immune responses can be good. I'm going to tell you why they can be bad. And this is called immunopathology or too much of a good thing. Last time I told you that flu-like symptoms are caused by cytokines like interferon and all the other symptoms of virus infections, fever, tissue damage, aches, pains, nausea, the cell damage that's caused. Most of this is to, due to the immune response to infection. And for viruses that are not cytolytic, that don't kill cells, the disease they cause is entirely immunopathological. So there's always a combination. For a virus that kills a cell, a lytic virus, a cytopathic virus, that makes a contribution to cell damage, obviously. But the immune response always makes a big contribution. And for viruses that don't kill cells, that's why you get disease. So let me tell you some examples of immunopathology. There are immunopathological mechanisms involving cytokines, we talked about those last times, CD8 cells, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, helper T cells of both classes, Th1 and Th2. There's also antibody-mediated immunopathology. So let me go through some examples of some of these for you. Here's a mouse model for a virus called uh, lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus, where lethality is entirely immunopathological. You take a mouse, you infect it with LCMV, in eight days is dead of lethal uh, brain infection. If you immune suppress the animal, you give it drugs that prevent uh, immune responses, very easy to do that, the, the animals live, they just get persistently infected. If you now give them, say, CD8 positive T cells that are specific for the virus, they die. So this is CD8 CTL mediated immunopathology. You could give them CD4 cells, you could give them antibody. The only thing that makes them die are the CD8s. So the CD8s are killing cells in the brain to try and get rid of the infection, but it's also killing the mouse. So there's not a good balance here uh, of infection, obviously. Now in these animals, you can see, you can have further proof that this is CD8 mediated. Uh, on the upper left, the same infection of mice with LCMV. Uh, wild type mice, the dark green line, they die within 10 days, percent alive. The top line, the light green, they all live. These are perforin knockout mice. They lack the gene for one of the proteins in the cytotoxic T lymphocyte that is responsible for killing infected cells. So these CTLs no longer kill cells. You can see the mice survive. So the CTLs are, are causing death. On the right is measurement of a liver enzyme. In wild-type mice, you can see uh, the liver enzyme is going up. So when viruses damage liver cells, liver enzymes are released. They're not normally at high levels in your circulation. So you can easily tell liver damage by simply taking some blood and measuring liver uh, enzymes. In the knockout, the perforin knockout mice, there's no uh, liver enzyme in the blood. So you can see this clearly shows that CD8 is mediating this pathology. At the bottom is a uh, se section of myocardium, heart muscle, from mice that are infected with Coxsackie virus, which is a virus that replicates in the heart and kills the tissue. And on the left is a wild-type mouse. It's stained with a dye that, that highlights the tissue damage. This, is, this light uh, blue color is all uh, heart cell damage caused by infection. If you infect perforin knockout mice, that's the section on the right, there's no damage to the heart. So the heart damage in this infection, which is lethal to the mice, again is caused by CD8 positive cytotoxic T lymphocytes. There is also CD4 T cell associated immunopathology. As you remember, these cells make a lot of cytokines, whether they're Th1 or Th2, many more cytokines than uh, CTLs. Uh, and those cytokines can recruit 
other cells into the infected area, and so that causes immunopathology. You know, cytokines on their own can cause uh, symptoms, and the cytokines that, that attract the cells uh, end up causing releases of proteases, reactive radicals like nitric oxide, cytokines, TNF-alpha that itself can kill cells. So these cells uh, can cause a lot of immunopathology. Let me show you an example of that. Uh, this is herpes stromal keratitis, very common cause of blindness in developed countries. So it's a herpes simplex infection that has gone to the cornea. So if you have a fever sore, please don't touch it and then rub your eye because you're going to transfer virus to your cornea. And then, then if you get enough of these infections, you go blind because the cornea gets uh, scarred and eventually becomes opaque and you can't see. This is caused by CD4 positive Th1 cells. And that's shown in this picture. These are two sections of uh, the corneal uh, layer, at two different magnifications. Uh, here's the corneal, the, the main part of the corneum, which is called the stromal cells here. And on top is a layer of epithelium. So your, eye, your cornea is coated with a layer of epithelial cells. The virus replicates in the epithelium, does not replicate in the stromal cells of the cornea. But that's where the damage happens in the stroma of the cornea. So these infected epithelial cells attract CD4 helper cells. They release cytokines which diffuse into the layer below and they damage the stromal cells. It's a bystander effect of these cells. So the, you know, the, the cells are trying to eliminate infection but they end up damaging uh, the stroma. Here's an example of cytokine mediated uh, uh, immunopathology. This is uh, West Nile encephalitis in mice. You infect mice uh, with this virus and they get encephalitis and die. It's a brain infection. But knockout mice lacking the gene for toll-like receptor 3 are much more resistant to lethal infection. I changed this word. You might have just infection here. It should be lethal infection because it doesn't prevent them from being infected. What's killing the mice is cytokine production. In particular, TNF-alpha, which permeabilizes the blood-brain barrier and allows the virus to get into the brain and cause lethal encephalitis. And that's shown in these pictures here of brains from various animals. These are whole brains taken out of the mice. These are mice that are infected with West Nile. So you put the virus peripherally, like intraperitoneally. And here are wild-type mice. You can see by day three, uh, the brains are blue. That's because you've also injected a dye a blue dye into these animals, which will not get in the normal, the brain of a normal mouse. Uh, so here, a toll-like receptor 3 knockout mice, you see it takes longer for the dye to get into the brain. So in wild-type mice, the dye is getting in by day 3, along with virus. So TNF is permeabilizing uh, the brain, letting the virus in. If you take away toll-like receptor 3, this apparently is a main sensor for virus infection. One of the cytokines it induces is tumor necrosis factor, which makes the brain permeable and lets the virus in. It's just, it's amazing, right, that you have all these effects and counter effects. Here on the right you can see these are mice that are not infected, they're just injected with the blue dye. You can see in a wild type mouse, uh, eventually the, the blue dye will get in. Uh, I'm sorry, these are wild type mice that are treated with poly-IC, which also is a ligand for TLR3, and you can see that permeabilizes the brain very quickly. Uh, and here's a 24-hour time point of poly-IC injected mice, uh, 24 hours wild type, 24 hours in the toll-like receptor 3 knockout. So again, poly-IC is double-stranded RNA which binds to toll-like receptor 3, turns on TNF. So that TLR3 is causing damage in this model of infection. When you get a rash from a virus infection, it is an immunopathological result. Uh, here's a, a child with measles, uh, but many other viruses cause, cause rash, and these are are typically caused by Th1 cells that are going to the skin. They, they know there's an infection there. They're being drawn there by chemokines. They go to the skin. They make cytokines. And you know cytokines cause inflammation, capillary permeability. They bring in other T cells. And the red rash that you see is an immune, <coughs> immune pathological reaction. If just the virus were replicating in your skin, there would be no rash. But the immune reaction, which is trying to clear the infection, is causing uh, these, these rashes. So here's an example of an antibody-mediated immunopathology, and this is dengue fever, also known as breakbone fever, because when you get it, your bones hurt a lot, apparently. It feels like they're breaking. Uh, 
And this is a virus transmitted by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. And it's a flavy virus. Uh, it's an icosahedral capsid surrounded by a membrane. This is an, an infection that's endemic in the Caribbean, Central and South America, Africa, Southeast Asia. And billions and billions of people are susceptible to this infection. There are about 50 million infections a year, second only to malaria in mosquito-borne diseases. So what is the problem here? So here's the um, range of Aedes aegypti in yellow. And then um, in red, you see where you have the mosquito and dengue activity. So the two coincide uh, pretty well, mostly south of the equator. But as we have global warming, the range of the mosquito goes higher and higher. You know, in 50 to 100 years, it's going to be all over the world. It's going to be hot everywhere, and the mosquito will have spread everywhere. This virus is spread around the world. I'm sorry, <laughs> the mosquitoes are spread around the world and use tires, which I told you before. These end up getting filled with water, and they transmit uh, the mosquito larvae very effectively. Now, before 1981, this is the uh, dengue in South America. There's no dengue. Before 1981, people used to use DDT to get rid of mosquitoes. So there was this global mosquito eradication program run by WHO, which used DDT. Now, of course, um, we, we learned that DDT is not a good thing to introduce into ecology. So we stopped using it, and the mosquitoes returned. So now that's why we have dengue here. So there's no way to get rid of these mosquitoes now. They're just everywhere, and it's because we're not eradicating them anymore. So what happens when you get dengue? You get this typical uh, virus infection, uh, asymptomatic or acute febrile illness, and then you get the headache back and limb pain and a rash. And usually you recover uh, in a week or 10 days, but sometimes you can get a very serious disease, one in 14,000 infections. You get hemorrhagic fever where your capillaries start to break and leak blood, and you can get shock and die. And so you can get this infection if you go to the Caribbean on vacation. You can come, you, you, it happens all the time. People come back to New York and they, they get this within a week or so. They get terrible pains in their bones. It's dengue. You make antibodies to the virus, but there are four serotypes. And there's no cross protection. So if you go somewhere and you get infected with dengue type 1, you could be infected again by types two, three, or four. And that's where the problem is, because the second infection can be much more lethal than one in 14,000. So what happens is you make antibodies. Let's say you get infected with type 1 dengue. You make antibodies to type 1. Then you go on another vacation. You get infected with type 2 or 3 or 4 dengue. You make a memory response to type 1, <clears throat> because there are, there's sufficient uh, cross-reactivity among the epitopes that your immune system says, oh, there's a dengue virus here. So you make antibodies to type 1, but they cannot neutralize the infectivity of the type 2 or 3 or 4 dengue. Okay, so that may not be so bad if you just got dengue, but what happens is those antibodies bind the type 2 or 3 or 4 virus, and they make it easy for it to get into macrophages, because macrophages have FC receptors, and that's shown here. So on the left, is a dengue binding an antibody. It's not neutralizing it because it's against the wrong serotype. These bind macrophages with FC receptors. Normally, the virus doesn't infect these cells, but this brings the virus in. It replicates in them, and all hell breaks loose because these cells now, and they're shown on the right here, they attract CD8s and CD4s. They release tons of cytokines because they're professional antigen-presenting cells, and you get complement reactivity, and you get all the inflammation associated with cytokine production. You have plasma leakage. So you get basically, in, at, a more, at a higher rate, you get this fatal shock syndrome and can die. And this incidence is uh, 1 in 90 and 1 in 50, fever and shock, compared to 1 in 14,000 for your first infection. So this is why dengue is a problem, not because of that first infection, but because of this antibody-mediated immunopathology that can lead to a fatal infection. So right now, people are working very hard to make vaccines against <clears throat> this virus. All four serotypes would have to be present in this vaccine and immunize all these people who are at risk. Now, there's not much dengue in the US. Most of the cases are imported. But there have been several occasions in Florida and Texas where a traveler brings the virus in and then it spreads and causes a little outbreak. But they always fizzle out because we don't have enough uh, virus present to sustain 
an infection. But we do have Aedes aegypti here in the U.S., and the potential does exist for a big outbreak if enough people are initially infected to sustain transmission. So this is mosquito, human, mosquito, human transmission. There's no animal involved in this. It's, we're the reservoir, so if there's not enough virus reservoir in people, we won't get sustained transmission. So in these outbreaks in Florida and Texas, you know, 10 or 20 people are infected. It's not enough to sustain an outbreak, but it could get to that point uh, eventually. All right, our last question. Which of the following is a mechanism for cell-mediated immunopathology? Cell-mediated, that's the key here. Oh dear, we're all over here. Wow. Cell-mediated immunopathology, that means a cell has to do it, all right? And there's only one cell here, that's CD8 CTLs, number three. Memory B cells don't lyse infected cells. Memory B cells make antibodies. A TNF is not a cell mediated mechanism. Non neutralizing antibodies are not. Okay, so it's just number three. There are two, there are two kinds of immunopathology there's cell mediated, and then there's uh, soluble protein mediated, like antibodies or cytokines. So that's the key to take away here. One more example of antibody mediated immunopathology. And this happens when, this is called immune complex formation. This happens when you have a, a substantial infection going on and a good antibody response. The antibodies combine with viruses. And sometimes this can, these can form deposits in tissues with very small blood vessels, very small capillaries. So you remember, you may remember last time I talked about how complement is meant in part to dissolve these antibody antigen complexes so they don't make deposits. Well, this happens anyway, and they will deposit in various places. In particular, the kidney and the brain have very small capillaries, and these can get stuck there. So here's on the right an example of this happening in the kidney. Uh, here is a normal glomerulus. You have a capillary here, and the blood, of course, is flowing through this, and it's being filtered uh, into the urinary space. And these red dots are immune deposits that are forming here. So, you know, the blood, you may have an infection somewhere else, but the virus antibody complexes are flowing through here. And if they're large complexes, they will start to get stuck and clog this uh, area outside of the capillary. And then that causes inflammation, basically. And one of the things that's happening here is this cell, this mesangial cell, is swelling. It's constricting the capillary. Eventually, it will stop the blood flow. So that's called uh, glomerular nephritis, or if this is happening in a cap small capillary anywhere, the inflammation is called vasculitis. So this can cause kidney dysfunction if this happens in, a, in your brain. Uh, the least of your troubles would be being confused. You could have more serious consequences as well. All right, so it just shows that the immune response can be great, but a lot of the time the, the symptoms of an infection and even beyond what the infection is doing is caused by the immune response. So it could be, it is a double-edged sword, I think. Uh, one more example, and that's nitric oxide synthase, which is an ISG, an interferon-stimulated gene. We mentioned this last time. It's a gene who's, which is induced by interferon, so viruses are sensed. The cells produce interferon. The inter interferons induce ISGs. Nitric oxide synthase makes nitric oxide out of arginine. Uh, this is, goes on to, to modify proteins so that they are inactive. And, and this is typically made by cells that are coming into an infective area. So this cell comes out of the blood, it's attracted to an infected cell area, it releases uh, peroxides and superoxides, uh, and these damage the cell, which is the attempt to stop the infection, but it causes cell damage. So in mouse models, for example, if you knock out the gene for this protein, nitric oxide synthase, you will often see less pathology caused by certain viral infections. So again, double-edged sword. It's good to have, but you have to recognize that it can be damaging. And unless things are regulated very precisely, uh, it can be worse than the infection. 